Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classics at columbusarts.com. This time on Broad and High, we'll visit a school that teaches its blind students the art and business of piano tuning. And when they graduate, they walk out of the door with the ability to go into business for themselves. And we'll get an up-close look at the restoration of some 500-year-old paintings. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi, I'm Audrey Hassan. Welcome to Broad and High. This week, we're exploring some unique endeavors taking place in arts communities all across the country. Our first stop, Washington State. In the city of Vancouver, there's a so-called piano hospital that has been teaching blind adults the art of piano refurbishing and tuning since the 1940s. In this segment, we'll follow one student who's traveled all the way from South Africa to learn the trade. Devald van Deventer was at university in South Africa when a friend tuned a piano he was playing. And I was just so amazed at how beautiful it sounded, I couldn't stop playing. And just thought that I would also like to learn to tune piano, and there was no one in South Africa I could, I could learn. With his seeing eye dog Molly beside him, Devald made his way to Vancouver, Washington. All right, students, we're going to talk about pedals. And the only post secondary school in the world that teaches tuning and piano technology to the blind. You follow straight back from the pedal, you'll see that you actually end up on the underside of the main shank of the pedal. The pedal is dropped down lower than the main body, the main of, the body of the pedal. So that pedal is dropped. So we call it a drop, drop pedal. pedal. And it has a horn. So it's the horn drop pedal? So that's a horn drop pedal. Devald, what kind of a pedal is this? Drop. We take up to six students at a time. And the students are with us for two years. And when they graduate, they walk out of the door with the ability to go into business for themselves. Is this square lip the uh, mouse proofer? Hanging down on the bottom? Yes. Yes or to work for a music store, to work for a university, just like that. Jeff Lan has been executive director of the School of Piano Technology for the Blind since 2011, but the school itself has a much longer history. It started way back in 1949, and at that time, the school was one of the vocational programs from Washington State School for the Blind, and they decided to do away with all the vocational programs. Emil Fries, who was the director of the piano technology part, said, you know, this is one of the ways that blind people can actually make a living and have a good career. And he took his life's earnings and opened up his own school. Seventy percent of blind people are unemployed. And he, Emil knew that if a person can find a, a career that um, was financially rewarding and emotionally rewarding, that it was a great career. And that's what his mission really was, is to really help people find independence and self-actualization. Since 1949, more than 300 men and women have graduated from the program and gone on to become professional piano technologists. Okay, Devald, let's check out the back checking on this piano. They're perfectly aligned. Uh, you want to feel that? Go ahead yeah. and put your hands up there and try one yourself. Just play the key. There yeah, you go. Okay. And feel the back stop and the back check and make sure they're lined up. The one is to the right or the left. First move it to the right at the top, right? Don Mitchell has been teaching at the school for 40 years and is himself a graduate. I call this guided experimentation. It's really nice to have a blind instructor. They 
tend to just explain things more richly to help you to understand how everything works. And piano work is a little bit difficult to understand. I would just barely move it to the left. You have this uh, domino effect happening. Did you overdo it? Yeah. I'll just bend it to the right now. You know, while the hammer is traveling to the strings, then this happens. And then while that happens, another thing happens, another part goes and do its thing. So it's, it's really um, difficult. Yeah, I think that's good. Except what's happened, now the B flat. Then you have to think about it. In fact, some pianos have more than 10,000 different parts. Even with all the complexity, DeVault has already come to know this piano quite intimately. This piano came in a few months ago uh, from a customer who wanted to restrung. And the next thing on my list in the curriculum was to restring a piano, so... <laughs> it doesn't sound great, but... I mean, it's more tuning. customer made a plaque <laughs> of this piano that was restrung in 2013 by the piano hospital by the old Neota that was quite amazing. <laughs> I've been blind almost 18 years. I was about nine years old when they discovered there was something wrong with my eyes and they found a brain tumor. So they had to do surgery and they, they damaged or cut the optic nerves, I'm not sure what. And that, that, that's how I lost my sight. Even the loss of his sight has done little to dampen DeVault's passion for the arts. He's been playing piano since he was 12 and earned a master's degree in music performance before taking up piano technology. Oh, that's how it sounds. <laughs> DeVault also paints. Chip Day, DeVault, you're painting with some blue paint. Okay, and give me your hand. Today, he's collaborating with Vancouver artist Michelle Venslick. I used to just paint when I could still see. I think I keep a picture in my mind of how the things look like. You see how beautiful it is, how expressive it is. It's a lot more than what I had expected it would be. So at that point then, I knew that I wanted him to paint on the piano with me. Once painted, this piano will be part of a community project. We really try to, to get involved with our community who have been very supportive of the school in so many ways. The Keys to the City is a great example of one of the ways in which we give back to our community. They're very expressive. Yeah. Good job. Okay. Through the Keys to the City program, pianos are restored by the school students, painted by local artists, and the occasional piano technologist. Then, for 10 days in the summer, placed around Vancouver for anyone to play. When you put those pianos in the community, and you encourage people to come and play those pianos, it creates a tremendous amount of energy, positive energy. After the first year, Jeff Land declared the program a win-win-win. Our students got to work on the pianos, um, the community got to play the pianos, the artists got to demonstrate their abilities, and, it, I mean, it was fun. Okay, good. Kevin. Okay, so that's a win-win-win-win. And it looks like Devald Van Deventer can add one more win to that string when he graduates next year. My plan is to return to South Africa. At the moment, there's only tuners that are uh, retiring and not, not really any new tuners. And they need, really need help all over South Africa. I already have three piano technicians that 
want to give the business over to me. I'm very glad and, and blessed to be here. Learn more about the School of Piano Technology for the Blind and see its gallery of reconditioned pianos from petite spinets to century-old uprights at pianotuningschool.org. We all know the number one rule when you go to the art museum. You can look at the art, but you can't touch it. So this next story might make you cringe when you see a man take a knife and hammer to some very old and very delicate works of art. But sometimes that's exactly what you have to do to bring an old painting back to life. This process of repairing and restoring works of art, in this case two 500-year-old paintings, is always painstaking, often risky, and if done right, will go completely unnoticed. Enjoy this segment from our friends at St. Louis PBS. These two portraits of a gentleman and a lady, names unknown, are on their way to a waiting spot in a gallery at the St. Louis Art Museum. For their age, they're going on 500 now, they look pretty darn good. But then they just had a major makeover by a man whose job is part artist, surgeon, chemist, and when necessary, carpenter. But let's start back to when Paul Hainer, the museum's paintings conservator, got his first good look at this old German couple. They were painted on wooden panels in Munich back in 1540 by artist Hans Mielich. The gentleman is holding his gloves and chose to wear his coat with the big fur collar. His wife is showing off her finest lace cuffs and gold jewelry. So um, and really, her costume is quite wonderful uh, from the... Judy uh, Mann is the museum's curator of European art to 1800. There, every link of the chain. To the untrained been. eye, the paintings look pretty good. But of course, Mann and Hainer can see a lot more, and they have the tools to dig even deeper. And infrared allows you to look just beneath the surface of the paint and to see the artist underdrawing, the preparatory sketch that he did so if you're trying to really establish what the, the picture looked like, underdrawing sometimes can serve as a guide. Looking on the screen, that very bow mouth that, that you see a lot in Mielik's uh, portraits. I think this is a carbon-based ink. And you can see the drawing in the mouth. The but this line, initial assessment is not just about the what the artist did, but what other people have done to the paintings since. So there's decisions to be made. There are a lot of old restorations. Do you take them off or do you leave them? And a lot of that is going to show up under a black light. Well, this one looks like it has a heavier layer of varnish. It's more yellow, it's more opaque. The face does not have very much retouching. There's a little bit right here. These are old restorations along this wooden split, along the wood split. Now the real work begins. He starts in one spot on the lady's face to see what will be needed to remove multiple layers and get down to the original paint. This can get complicated, but it starts out simply with a bit of soap and water. Typically with an old painting that hasn't been treated for quite a long time, it has a layer of dust and grime, and so uh, you have to remove that. Under the dirt is varnish that was applied in a previous restoration. It is a natural resin, standard stuff in this kind of work, and it can be removed with a mild solvent. The natural resin varnish comes up yellow. But below that varnish, Hainer runs up against something a bit unusual. Um, there is a layer of very early uh, synthetic resin varnish. This is something that was put on probably in the 50s, mm. 1950s. And it's like a, a plastic layer. Well, that means it won't completely dissolve in the solvent. It will swell. And then um, under the microscope, you have to you essentially scrape it off with a scalpel. It sounds scary. It sounds It's a little bit dangerous, but it's really the safest way to do this. I just have to be careful not to catch an edge. 
the end result is very good. It just takes a long time and it's, it's very slow. You simply cannot rush this. It has to be done little bit by little bit over the entire painting. And when he's done, he will start on the next one. Hainer's job is not just to undo what others have done, but to make sure that his work can be undone in the future if need be. Techniques and technologies change, and there can be unintended consequences. Many years ago, the wooden panels were thinned way down and glued to a lattice of wood strips called a cradle. It was designed to prevent the paintings from warping and cracking. But on the gentleman's portrait, it just didn't work. The result is that the wood split, the panel has split. The cradle is causing this damage, so it has to be removed. These are sawed very carefully, gently. Still taking a hammer and a chisel to a 500-year-old painting. Yeah, is... it's a little nerve-wracking. <laughs> the painting's going to be very close to coming, in, coming apart into two pieces. Right. As it turns out, the gentleman from Munich did not split in two, and that made repairing and aligning the crack a little bit easier. This is a really nice adhesive because it flows well. Hainer uses a natural fish glue. It's water soluble, meaning like everything else he does to the paintings, this can be undone. So I've got a bar clamp. Notice that without the cradle backing, the panel is now curved. That's where the wood wants to be, and that's the way Hainer will leave it. And then, uh, Often portraits well, like these have gotten separated, ending up in different museums, but these have stayed together all these years. They will join some other portraits. And Judy Mann knows exactly where she wants to put them, alongside other works by 16th century Northern European artists, including the star of this gallery, Hans Holbein's portrait of Lady Guildford. Hans Holbein is a major figure of the 16th century. He was the court artist for Henry VIII. Hans Mielich is someone, one who comes from a different city, Munich, which we don't have any Munich art. Um, and secondly, he was kind of the great portraitist for the middle class. So it rounds out our collection in a lot of ways. And it's a But she knew it would be some time before those Mielich portraits would be ready for public viewing. This is what the lady looks like after the dirt and varnishes have been removed. Over the centuries, cleanings have damaged Melik's very thin paint layer. Those big splotches are places where insects had eaten into the wood and previous restores had filled with putty. Hainer will replace some of those repairs. Just chip it out with a knife so that you get down to clean wood. I'm just cleaning out the material from the fill with a soft brush. Now I'm going to put some of this toned putty into the, and uh, I mixed up the color that I, I want for this. And I use the microscope to put it in the loss. We have a cork, small cork, and you put the damp fabric over it. Oh, this is something that I learned from my, in conservation school 30 years ago. <laughs> It's, I'm sure it's a very old technique. Hainer then colors in the new dried putty, but he will not put any paint directly on top of Hans Melix. When the repairs are done, Hainer puts on a new coat of varnish. And now his paint goes on top of that, and it will come off if the varnish is ever removed. This is really where the artist in you has to be uh, drawn upon, I guess. Right. right. This is, uh, this is, in painting can be a lot of fun. It's very satisfying to reconstruct and to put the missing areas back and to try to unify the surface so that it's presentable and readable and it's a picture again. It is a craft and it is an art. It is tedious and it is tricky and if done well, it is anonymous. We wouldn't try to elaborate or embellish, not recreate, but just try to reconstruct and unify 
the artist's original intention. I'm very pleased with the way they've, they've turned out. One of the things I, I notice here, and seeing the folds in her dress. Right, with the old varnish on it, the, the subtle transitions that you have in the, in the folds and in the shading, yeah, that was kind of uh, covered up with the old uh, varnish and restoration. He especially, he seems more real to me now, I think, than, than when we first started looking at this. Good. <laughs> After all this work, and we left a lot out, the paintings go in new frames, custom built in London appropriate to the artist and the era. She is still in the old wooden cradle, but his frame has been fitted to accommodate the curve that the panel has taken on. And on a Monday morning, when the museum was closed, the lady and the gentleman of Munich, who had their portraits painted by Hans Mielich, nearly five centuries ago, took their place in a gallery in the St. Louis Art Museum. A painting treatment as major as this, when you really essentially take the painting apart and then have to put it back together again, and to be able to bring them back to a, a really a, a very exhibitable state and, and representing the artist in the period well. It's, it's a satisfying feeling. Our final stop tonight is California. Since its opening more than 125 years ago, the Crocker Art Museum has been a jewel of the Sacramento art community. It was the first public art museum founded in the Western United States and is one of the leading art museums in California. In this next segment, we'll wander the halls of the original Victorian building and into the heart of the more contemporary pavilion for an inside look at this historic institution and its seamless merging of past and present. You know, a lot of people have thought about the Crocker as um, a, a small regional art museum uh, in Sacramento. And the Crocker is, you know, a, a great regional art museum. It's not small. It hasn't been small. Um, before expansion, the museum was about the 100th largest art museum in North America. Lots of different people come from not just this city, not this, this county, but around the world to see the Crockers. We've created a bridge between the old and new physical architectural spaces so that they're rather seamless. You walk from a beautiful contemporary building to a beautiful Victorian building building and I think you understand the architectural splendor of both maybe in a way you didn't before at least I hope that's part of what happens we also have a greater depth and variety of work on display and part of understanding art is not just staying with work that you're comfortable with but expanding your horizons as a viewer to work that you haven't normally liked in the past giving it a chance and when you see it in context with work that you do like often you find uh, your own tastes broaden I people People often ask me, what's your favorite work of art? And I always sidestep that question. I, I, I say it's somewhat akin to asking a parent who's your favorite child. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing, but what I find with works of art is what I like partly depends on my mood in any particular day. So I may love something one day, and the next day it's no longer in my top ten, even, you know, well, on my favorite piece. Well, you know, I, I believe that art can be restored. Uh, if you are having a great day, art can help you celebrate that great day. If you're having a rather melancholy time, you can find solace in looking at different paintings. Uh, we have enough work on view that there's something for everybody all of the time. We are an institution with a tremendous history. I think that the thing that I most want people in this region to know and to feel in their hearts is uh, that sense of pride and that sense of ownership uh, in this new building and what it will do today and 125 years into the future and more. Uh, the museum's had a proud history. I think it's got a great future. 
ColumbusArts.com is Central Ohio's most comprehensive source for arts and cultural events. Be sure to check it out to find great things happening around town this week. That's our show. To see more of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. And be sure to download the WOSU Public Media mobile app, where you can watch full episodes on your smartphone or tablet. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com.